He was coming to Christ. He was going to bring forth the Messiah whereby he can bring all men both and all things both in heaven and which are in earth into that one body into Christ. Yeah. Becoming part of that new creation that embodies, that encapsulates all the treasures, all the benefits of heaven, being heirs of God, Romans 8, Romans 8 and verse 17, and join heirs with Christ. Partakers of the inheritance therein. Whatever God has, brothers and sisters, we also have. We are the inheritors of the benefits. God is our Father and we are His sons. Consider the thought of being a son of God. The, the treasures that are His also belong to us, those of us who are Christians, that is. But we live in a world of people that surround us who do not share in our rich benefits. But we know, and as we consider passages 2 Peter 3 and 9, we do know this. It is God's will that not any should perish. We do know these words also laid in 2 Peter 3 and verse 15, account the long-suffering of God as salvation. God is extending his hand of long-suffering and, and hopes that all men everywhere will be saved. That is God's ultimate desire, and it should be ours too. But he's left a great and magnificent responsibility on our hands. And as we consider the, the work of redemption and our part in it, rather than us look at it as being burdensome and grievous, we ought to take it with joy because heaven has allowed us to have a place, to have a part in the overall scheme of things as it relates to redemption. With those things in mind, we consider our, our subject. How do we introduce New Testament Christianity? We know the Great Commission. We have been told to go. We are, we are familiar with that. The question is not a matter if, if we go. The question is often a matter as to how do we go? How do we become, how, how do we go and we in effectively engage intellectually, intellectually those that have puffed themselves up against the knowledge of God? Not even just those, those who may be in the predicament of Paul that are just honestly and sincerely ignorant. But nevertheless, this is what we know and we are assured of. God wants to sow and he has placed the burden of of helping those individuals to see the light, to see the Christ, to see the cross on our, on our, on our shoulders. And how do we accomplish that? And, it, and this evening, we want to look at a few things as it relates to that. We turn our attention to a text I began to look at as we, as I thought on this lesson, I have you to turn your attention with me to the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 12, and verse 32. First Chronicles chapter 12 <clears throat> in verse number 32. And the text reads as such, and I'm reading from the King James Version. The Bible says, and of the children of Issachar, which men, which were men, and listen to these words, that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. I would have you to consider that thought as we, con as we consider the subject matter, how to introduce New Testament Christianity. The question how to seeks for a method. It seeks for an approach to attain the desired result. What is the desired result to present, introduce Christianity? And we consider this text in this light. And I would also have our attention to go back to eternity and go back to God who himself is very methodical and he's very systematic. 
He has a strategy in which he has set in place in order to um, attain his desired results, results. And ultimately, that was redemption. Uh, that was reconciliation. That was salvation for all of humanity. We read Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 4. The time was right. God had set the stage in his methodical and systematic ways of thinking. He has come to this great and grand event. He has brought the Christ who will find himself on the cross. Oh, the manifold wisdom of God. He's accomplished his task. And prior to his departure, Jesus, that is, he would gather together his men and tell them to go. And the perpetual nature comes down to the year of 2017, the month of October, to the West Hill Church of Christ. And we are asking the question, how do we introduce New Testament Christianity? A valid question. Something we need to consider. I think as Christians, we need to take the time to draw back. We need to take the time to step back and actually seek to see what it is, what type of minds we are dealing with. I'm convinced this was the situation even in the first century. We go and we look at passages. Go with me to the book of Luke, chapter 2. And I found it interesting as I was studying for this lesson, when I, when I saw this text, it actually grabbed my attention. <clears throat> Jesus is, o, is on earth and he's readying himself at the age of 12. Um, he has come to knowledge of some things and he is found in Jerusalem having, having been left there by his parents. And, and this is what is going on in Luke chapter 2, verse number 46. The words of these, and it came to pass after, the, after three days that they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of doctors. And I want you to listen to these words, both hearing them and asking them questions. Jesus is learning. And as he's listening, he's learning how people think. He's learning people's theology. He's learning what makes people tick. And as he would proceed 18 years later, these things reside in his mind. He's talking to what we would call in our vernacular the scholars of the day. So he's learning their mind. He's learning how they operate. He's learning what makes them move. How does that relate to the particular subject matter at hand? And when it comes to us and trying to find an, an effective method, we are going to have to learn how people think. We're, we're going to have to learn what makes people move, what makes them tick if we are going to be effective. We come and we consider the passage in First Chronicles, in First Chronicles chapter 12, and we, and we, and we, and we, we bring out this particular thought. We must learn how to evaluate the situations. A few questions for you as we consider this. In our world, in our time, we're, we're dealing with something that, that others in years past have not had to deal with. We dealing with those who are transgender. How do you deal with a man that heaven wants his soul? God desires to redeem him and to reconcile him. He, he wants him, but how do we deal with an individual who has actually done things to himself to, to change himself that he can never go back to change? This man is, is, has, a, has a mindset um, that is very in, that is in opposition to the ways of heaven and is thinking and, and heaven's thinking, but this man is an honest man, and this man is actually a man that heaven wants to save. How do I deal with that individual? I have to draw back and consider the times and consider what I'm dealing with. We have to be systematic, we have to be methodical, we want to be effective, but we need to know what the adversary has placed before us. We need to be like the Corinthians in the days of Paul and not be ignorant as to, as to his devices. And I'm wondering if we are. I'm wondering if we have forgotten that the adversary ultimately being said in that, that we fight, that, that we are in opposition to, himself is very methodical. 
He has no desire for the redemption of any soul. And whatever it takes to, to, to produce his desired result, he's going to seek to accomplish. We are in combat with him. So we draw back. We oftentimes talk of the millennial mindset and postmodernism and relativism and those things with that, those, those particular doctrines and philosophies that people are moved by. Ultimately, they are driven by their emotions and the desires to please themselves, not wanting to have a king that rules over them. They want to be their own God at the root of it all. That's what you see. That's what we find. How do we deal with those individuals? How do we deal with the mindset of the youth nowadays? How do we deal with the adults who have been actually influenced by youth, even among us? Let me say this, and I don't, I don't mean no harm by saying what I say, but what's causing our youth to not have any interest in spiritual things is, is not the lack of of Six Flags movies and water parks. We, we give them plenty of that. That's not what's causing them to, dis, to not have interest in spiritual things. What is causing it is failure for us to give them strips to the cross. When they begin to see the cross, when they begin to see the Christ of the cross, that's when an individual's mind is illuminated. That's when an individual, an individual begins to understand that's what we have to help people to see, but we have to approach this methodically. We have to approach it systematically. We have to learn what, we have, what we're dealing with in our time. So we're going to have to evaluate the situation. How do I deal with this particular situation? So that brings us to this point. There is going to take some mental preparation on our behalf. We consider the words of Paul to Timothy. Go with me real quickly. 1 Timothy chapter 4. In verse number 14, we begin reading there. Paul would write to Timothy, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things, give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. He says these words to Timothy, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine, continue in them, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Timothy had a divine given responsibility. And the charge Paul presents to him is that he gives himself, New American Standard says, give himself wholly to it. The word, can also, the word that is translated meditate in the King James and give that and holy in the New American Standard can actually be, can actually be translated take pains with these things. The mental agony that, that the, 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 in, the intellectual calisthenics that you must, uh, that you must partake in to, to, to be the servant, to fulfill the, 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 the divine given responsibility you have. Give yourself wholly to it. Continuing to take heed unto yourself, continual observation, continual examination. You have a divine given responsibility to the preacher, yes, also to all. We have been given a divine given duty. We have been given the commission to go into all the world to preach to God. Us Christians, those of us who claim citizenship in the kingdom of heaven, we are given the divine responsibility. So what, was, what's, what must we do, like Paul would tell Timothy? We've got to prepare ourselves. We have to give ourselves wholly to the cause. We have to, give, we have to dedicate ourselves totally to the mission. Remember the words of God to Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 2, verse number 3. As he readied him for his mission to go to face the stiff-necked, hard-hearted, um, individuals of Judah that were already in captivity but we still see the desire of God to to inform them of things that they needed to do in order to repent but he told them this is what's going to be the case but here's what you do prior to your going 
Prior to you facing them, take that which I give you and allow it to go down into your belly. Eat the word, Ezekiel. Here is what you're dealing with. He gave him an exegetical lesson as to the type of people he was dealing with. This is who you are going to face. And, and we need to know who we're going to face. And, and we need to allow ourselves to ingest as much of, as much of the divine truth as heavenly possible as we seek to fulfill our divine given the role we see also we consider also these words in Matthew 9 go with me real quickly as we consider once again the mental preparation I would have you to consider with me this Matthew 9, we'll begin reading around verse number 10. And listen to the words. And it came to pass, as Jesus said at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, why eat if your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. Jesus finds himself in the midst of those in which he desired to save. Those who are actually in need of redemption. The Bible lets us know that these people would come to him, the publicans and sinners that is, and they would begin to converse with him. If Proverbs 4.23 and following has anything to say, it says these words. Go with me real quickly. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse number 23. And we listen to the words. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. In Matthew chapter 15, similar words are, are used when we look at Matthew 15, verses 16 through 20. The Bible says, and Jesus said, are you also yet without understanding? Do you not understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draw? But those things which proceed out of the mouth, the Bible says, come from the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulterers, fornications, theft, false witnesses, and blasphemy. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashing hand does not defile a man. What are you saying, Lord? What comes out of your mouth tells me what's in your heart. What are you, what are you, what are you trying to emphasize, brother? As Jesus said, with sinners, he began to understand their deepest emotions. Again, he began to learn what makes them tick. He begins to learn what the issue is. He begins to learn their problems, and he takes note. And taking note, I can do something with the thing. How many of us are ready to sit in the home of a homosexual and actually listen to him? How many of us are ready to sit into the home of an adulterer and actually just Listen to him. Heaven desires the soul, but I'm afraid oftentimes we look at an individual as if that individual is far past the borders of redemption. And we care not to listen to them because like the Pharisee, we don't want to be associated with that kind of people, but heaven does. And what gives us the audacity to look at an individual whom once at point in time we were just like, we may not have committed the same thing, we, not have, we may not have been part of the same heinous activity as we view it, but we were a part of sin and need of redemption. And somebody took time out to listen to us. And may God have mercy on our soul that we don't do the same. We have to listen then we can become affected. Then we know what we're dealing with. 
So we step back and we consider the times. We learn whom we are dealing with. We, we seek to learn how to deal with it. We are trying to introduce Christianity. We are trying to present to those individuals hope, some of which I'm convinced is looking for hope. Proverbs 13 and 15 is clear, lets us know the way of the transgressor is hard. The soul is crying out for help, even if they don't know it. Read the, about the church of the lay of the sea, and we'll look at that on tomorrow as we deal with the next lesson. But these people were in their eyes and needed nothing. They were rich and had all that they needed. And Jesus would come and do an evaluation of them, a strategic one that is. You're lukewarm, and you say you have neither nothing, but you do not know that you're poor, wretched, blind, and naked. This is your spiritual state. And there are those in the world who, who are in that same state. Soul is crying out from spiritual Egypt, crying for redemption. And we have the message of the New Testament Moses, if you will. We have the words of the Redeemer. We have the words of hope. We have the words of peace. We have the words of joy that can bring um, solemnity to their very soul. We have the words of the Christ that said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all you that labor. The call of the gospel. Consider the words. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye. The greatest invitation ever known to man. I know some of you here may be cowboy fans, but you can, be, you can rest assured that none of us will ever get the opportunity to sit in Jerry Jones' office. But the God of heaven desires for us to be in his presence. Take the yoke of, burden off, of, of the burden off and take my yoke. I want to plow through the fields with you. And there are those who are in those Sickening situations who Jesus wants to yoke himself to. And we have been given the privilege, if you will, to systematically approach these situations and seek to give these individuals resolve. So what do we do? We draw back. We give attention to the situation. We evaluate it. We come up with a systematic and methodical approach. We learn the people. We listen to the people. We talk to the individuals. Allow them to pour their hearts out to it. You, if, if a man ever grows enough confidence to allow you into his home, you can rest assured in most cases he's going to pour his heart out to you. You can listen to him. And we need to, like Jesus, we may have to go into the houses of publicans and sinners and give ear. And lastly, as we draw back and consider the situation in which we're dealing, we put ourselves through the mental agony to try to determine the methodical and systematic approach. Let us be mindful as we begin to execute of these words. John 13, 34, and 35. When Jesus gave a new commandment, that you love others as I've loved you. Matthew 5, 23, Jesus says, call no man a fool. What, is, what does he mean there? As I've examined the text, this is what I've come to conclude. That, that Jesus is saying, don't ever look at an individual. As, he's, as if he's beyond the possibility of redemption. We can't make that call. You don't make that call. 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. Love, hopeth all things. Love, believeth all things. Everybody, give everybody the benefit of the doubt as we proceed. There may be a Paul in the midst of the homosexuals. There may be a Peter in the midst of the adulterers that is waiting to see the light of redemption. The best day of Paul's, life is when, uh, of Paul's life is when he could not see. The best day he ever had when, he, when his eyes was closed. He saw clearer than he ever had seen. And we have to learn how to help people close their eyes 
and open their spiritual eye. But we have to learn them. We're going to have to be methodical. We're going to have to be consumed with this thing if we're going to be effective. And always remember that we ourselves were at one point in time in the predicament and the situation that they are in. Go with me real quickly to Titus. <clears throat> Titus chapter 3. Contextually, he's speaking of their attitude towards the authorities. In chapter 3, verse number 1, he says these words, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Listen to what he says. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, diverse lust and pleasure, serving diverse lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But here's the contrast. After that, the kindness of love, after that, the kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy. He saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What changed the minds of those who were afore, lustful, hateful, malignant, what they saw they saw the light of the gospel they saw the Christ we remember in Mark chapter 5 the man there that had the unclean spirit legion as he calls himself in that text had control over this one particular man in so much that he lived among the tombs and he was shackled and the shackles that they sought to place on him constantly he would break this is how much control this particular spirit had over this individual but the text reveals to something, something to, to us that, should, that is very moving, that is, that is something that should, should, should gather our attention. When this particular individual saw the Christ, immediately the Bible lets us know he ran to him and bowed down in worship. At the moment he saw the Christ, for a split second he was able to be in his right mind. Now the, end of the, the, the unclean spirit still resides in the individual and it it's going to take the Christ to remove it. We know this was during the miraculous age. And when the Christ removed that particular demon, later we'll see him sitting clothed and in his right mind. There are those who are mentally incarcerated with sin. They are burdened with it. And what do they need to see? They need to see the same thing Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah could look to heaven and he see this image of God, when he saw God, he was able to then see himself. And then he said, woe is me. Yeah. You want somebody to see themselves? Help them to see the cross. But always remember as we execute, we keep the love of Christ ingrained in our hearts and our minds. Yeah. We're seeking to help heaven redeem and not to condemn. So we draw back. How do we introduce New Testament Christianity? We consider the sons of Issachar men who understood the time. We as the soldiers of Christ need to know what we're dealing with. And maybe we have been taking a wrong approach for several years. Maybe we need to change our methods. No, I'm not speaking of changing doctrine. Please believe me. Please hear me when I say that. Uh, Mike Vestal made this observation. I held to it. Thought it was quite a wise observation. He said we need to remain our, maintain our scriptural integrity but learn how to operate in a contemporary society. Yeah. thought those were great words. And I took those words and actually into this lesson as I sought to develop. What are we dealing with? And brothers and sisters, what we need to do is step back. Our evangelism teams, our elders, our preachers, 
Let us seek to understand what we're dealing with. There are souls still in need of redemption. There are souls that still want to be redeemed. But they don't know where to find it, but we do. And we have to take it to them. Let us ready ourselves. Let us prepare ourselves. Every soldier that goes in, you do not want America going to battle for you and they're not ready. Jesus doesn't either. So let's ready ourselves for the mission at hand, our divine given responsibility. And as we execute, let's remember the task at hand. We're seeking to serve and to save those that are lost, as Jesus did. And if we do those things, and as we seek to introduce Christianity, hope, joy, peace, comfort, solemnity, inheritance, those that desire it, they'll accept it. And as the writer of Luke, or the words of Jesus recorded by Luke, and over the one sinner that repents, we read that text this way, the angels rejoice in heaven. That's not what the text says. I encourage you to go and read it. It's not what the text says. The text says there is joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repents. God rejoices when the homosexual repents. God rejoices when the transgender repents. God rejoices when the adulterer repents. And the list goes on. Those are oftentimes some of the sins that we find to be very heinous and we tend to draw away from. But heaven is seeking to rejoice. And may we assist heaven in doing that. Thank you.